last time we met the first ape man hunter, Eugene Dubois and his Pithecanthropus. That means ape man, since Pithecus is the official name for ape and Anthropus is the official name for man. We saw last time that it was reconstructed from part of what Dubois claimed to be a gibbon skull and a human thigh bone. It's still in the textbooks as a stage in the evolution from ape to man. But the most famous ape man was found in 1912 by an English lawyer, Charles Dawson, better known as a paleontologist since he had published 50 papers on paleontology. He found parts of a skull in a gravel pit in the south of England. The head of geology at the British Museum of Natural History, Arthur Smith Woodward, went with Dawson to the gravel pit and they found some more little bits of skull. They put together the pieces and published a paper introducing Eoanthropus dawsonii, that means Dawson's Dawn Man. Some very famous evolutionists, including Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, joined in the search. He found another tooth. Arthur Keith was not happy with the way Woodward and his team had put the bits of bone together, and he rearranged the pieces to make Homo Piltdownensis, meaning Piltdown Man, after the village of Piltdown, quite near to the gravel pit. Some top experts, like Grafton Elliot Smith, sided with Woodward's reconstruction. Others agreed with Arthur Keith. But just about everybody came to agree on the name, Piltdown Man. In 1913, the anatomist David Waterston said the jaw was from an ape and the skull was from a man. In 1915, the French expert Marceline Boulle said the same thing. They were ignored and Piltdown Man continued to be the prime exhibit at the British Museum, acclaimed as the first Englishman. In 1921, America's most famous paleontologist, Henry Fairfield Osborne, confirmed that the skull and the jaw were from the same creature and definitely belonged together, and this was definitely an ape man. He was taken very seriously, after all. He was the discoverer of Tyrannosaurus rex. Looking at Piltdown Man's artistic reconstructions, we can see as great a variety of ape man as we got from Java Man. And these marvellous pictures are based on a few bits of skull, three teeth and a damaged jawbone. Most ape men are presented to the public without any indication of what is bone and what is plaster of Paris. The famous ape-man hunter Richard Leakey said, it's mostly imagination. In the case of Piltdown, we can see what is the evidence and what is the imagination, because the plaster of Paris, the imagination part, is white, and the bones are clearly coloured. That's not the case with most Aitman skulls. Piltdown Man has much more bone and less imagination than most of the ape men. The first Englishman's skull remained the prize exhibit at the British Museum for more than 50 years. But then three experts in anatomy and reconstruction, Kenneth Page Oakley, Wilfred Edward Legros Clark and Joseph Viner, proved beyond any doubt what David Waterstone and Marceline Boole had pointed out from the beginning. It was a forgery made up from a doctored ape's jaw, some bits of a doctored human skull, and some chimpanzee teeth filed to make them look more human. More than 200 scientific papers had been published about Piltdown Man's place in the evolution of man from the apes. About 50 PhDs had been awarded 
for theses dealing with Piltdown Man's place in the evolution of man from the apes. Three of the key protagonists were given knighthoods for their part in showing this prince among the ape men's position in the evolution of man from the apes. But we might ask, why did the experts take no notice of the warnings of David Waterston and Marcelin Bull? The plain fact is that evolutionists were desperately looking for evidence for evolution, and it was very easy to convince themselves that they'd got it at last. And why did the fraudsters risk their reputations and their careers? I wonder if they were becoming embarrassed by the fact that there was simply no evidence for the evolutionary theory they'd been preaching for so long. And who were the fraudsters anyway? Nobody doubts that Charles Dawson was the prime mover in the plot. But what about the others? How about Arthur Smith Woodward? The kit for staining the bones to make them look old was found in his assistant's cupboard at the British Museum. But I suppose we'll never know with certainty. But what we do know is that the evolutionists try to make this whole story a feather in their cap instead of the absolute humiliation which it is. And how could they possibly do that, you might ask? Well, you see, they say this is a wonderful example of science correcting its own mistakes. But Piltdown Man was not proved false because it was inconsistent with the latest findings of science. It was shown that the evolutionists who put together some bits of bone that had been stained to make them look old were fraudsters, not worthy of the name of scientists at all. There is no triumph for science here. It was just an evolutionary fraud. And there's another thing which refutes this claim. Evolution has nothing to do with science. The acclaimed French scientist Pierre-Paul Grasset pointed out that science knows nothing of evolution. We cram a singer, Hoyle, Spetner and many other scientists have demonstrated that the impossibility of evolution is a fact of science. And the ultimate authority, God's Word, the Bible, tells us God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. So what about all those other eight men? Let's look at them next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, Please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.